There are so many types of groups. For instance, there are finite groups and infinite groups. You can have abelian groups and non-abelian groups. And there are many other ways you can group groups. Because groups are complex things, it's helpful to have a variety of examples in mind. This will help you to avoid oversimplifying the subject. Some infinite groups that are abelian are the integers, rational numbers, real numbers, and complex numbers under addition. A common finite group that's abelian is the integers mod n under addition. A classic example of a finite non-abelian group is a symmetric group Sn when n is larger than 2. But what about infinite groups that are non-abelian? This I can describe in one word, matrices. Matrices appear in algebra as a tool for solving systems of equations. They're used in calculus for describing the derivative of higher dimensional functions. Matrices are central to the subject called linear algebra. And in abstract algebra, there are a rich set of examples of infinite non-abelian groups. There are two ways to make a group from matrices, using addition or multiplication. For example, the 2 by 3 matrices with real numbers form a group under addition. The identity element in this group is the zero matrix. And while this is an infinite group, it is an abelian group. We're after infinite groups that are non-abelian. Next, let's look at real matrices under multiplication. We want a collection of matrices which can be multiplied together. So we need to restrict our group to n by n square matrices. If we allowed non-square matrices, then you could find two elements which could not be multiplied together. We now have our elements and the operation. Let's now check the requirements of a group. The identity element is the n by n identity matrix. Multiplication with real matrices is associative. All that remains is to make sure each matrix has an inverse. To have an inverse, a matrix must have a non-zero determinant. If the determinant is zero, then the matrix does not have an inverse. With this final requirement, we have a group. It's called the general linear group, the group of invertible matrices, and is written like this. The R lets us know the matrix entries are real numbers, and the N tells us the size of the matrices. If we skip the trivial case of one by one matrices, then the general linear group is non-commutative. An important subgroup of the general linear group is the N by N matrices with determinant one. This group is called the special linear group and is written like this. To see why these form a group, recall that the determinant of a product is equal to the product of the determinants. So if A and B are in the special linear group, then the determinant of A is 1 and the determinant of B is 1. This means the determinant of AB is equal to 1, which means AB is in the group. The identity matrix has determinant 1, so it's in the group. We still have associativity, which just leaves inverses. Once again, we look at the determinants. A times A inverse is the identity matrix I. So the determinant of A times the determinant of A inverse is the determinant of the identity. This reduces to 1 times the determinant of A inverse equals 1. Simplifying gives us the determinant of A inverse equals 1. So the inverse is in the group. When defining the general linear group and special linear group, we used real matrices. But there is no reason to be so restrictive. It's perfectly okay to have matrices with complex entries. In fact, you can have matrices with entries from any field, including finite fields. <laughs>